Uh, Dr. Aaron Mazzeo, who is uh, currently a postdoc in the White Sides groups at Harvard University. Prior to joining that group, Aaron studied at MIT where he got uh, his undergraduate and graduate degrees in mechanical engineering, at which time he worked on hot embossing of microfluidic devices, megatronics, and precision engineering. And as a mechanical engineer, he then went for a postdoc position at Harvard University under the headship of a chemist who has a fairly diverse uh, team of uh, postdocs and graduate students, including several engineers uh, of uh, uh, spanning the different disciplines of engineering. And in that team, currently, Aaron is working on paper-based electronics, soft robots, and uh, smart elastomers uh, with energy applications uh, in view. Okay. Uh, with this said, uh, give you the floor. Well, well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I am going to talk about design and manufacture of soft material-based systems. And I'm interested in high-tech applications that these types of materials enable, and also in keeping cost uh, low. I'll talk about a few examples. Um, from, from my PhD work and, and, and experience as a postdoc, uh, specifically centrifugal casting of microfluidic devices, uh, flexible electronics, and, and soft actuators. And to just kind of start off, um, I want to go through a few examples of, of, of current um, and kind of historical um, advances in, in a few of these um, areas that are using soft materials. So to start, let me, let me talk about um, microfluidics a little bit. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the 1980s, essentially, there was a lot of work in developing inkjet, inkjet cartridges. So probably most of us have, have used uh, an inkjet printer at some point. And uh, this technology it, it has very small channels and, uh, and uh, delivers uh, fluid to, to paper, right? Um, uh, that said, uh, and it's a manufacturing technology and you know, fairly uh, low cost um, devices as, as a result. But in the realm of experimental microfluidics, the approach of using semiconductor processing techniques resulted in, in, in kind of um, long times for, for fabrication of, of new designs. This is very expensive. Then um, in the late 1990s, there was a, a push um, to, to start to use soft materials that you could cast on uh, patterned uh, wafers. Okay? And so what you see here are a couple examples of, of geometries that um, have been enabled uh, using um, a silicone um, that with, with the acronym PDMS, polydimethylsiloxane. And um, in the, the upper images that you see here, these are some of the first uh, microchannels that were cast um, in, in PDMS. And then below that, uh, because PDMS is an elastomeric material and it and it's, uh, has, has a, a fairly uh, low elastic modulus, what, what they were able to do is start to have channels cross over each other and have small membranes between these channels. And by inflating channels in one layer, block flow in another layer. Or in this case, uh, they have three of them, and they were able to create a peristaltic pump. In, in the realm of, of flexible electronics um, that are, are based both on um, elastomeric materials, so, so PDMS has, has, again, played a, a big role in this, in this field. Um, and, and then paper, uh, more recently, is, is becoming um, a, a player as a material. Um, so, so what you see here on the upper left is uh, an image of, or, um, uh, these are inorganic uh, LEDs that have been uh, put on, a, on an elastomeric substrate. Upper right, um, these, are, uh, uh, this is a, these are flexible um, circuit boards um, that, that have paper as the main substrate. And paper um, has some advantages. It's, it's burnable. It's uh, essentially a low-cost, environmentally benign material. Um, on the bottom left, you, you see here um, some, some recent work out of John Rogers' group um, for, for doing different types of uh, biosensing. And then on the bottom right, we'll talk about this a little bit more. This is some of our, our recent work um, in, in looking at um, uh, paper-based electronics and, and creating human interfaces. And then uh, soft materials are, are playing a role in the, the field of soft robots. So I had the opportunity 
to, to work with Rob Shepard. He's done some great work with the group. We've, we've been able to do a lot of interesting things, and, and, and there's continual development in this area. But, but what you see here is uh, essentially uh, a silicone rubber that's been given uh, various air bladders, and uh, with, with coordinated pressurization of these, of these separate air bladders, you're able to, to get locomotion. So the idea is that these robots are, are right now, they're tethered, and uh, they could potentially, there, there's development work um, to, to you know, try to untether them, but even as tethered uh, robots, they have some interesting um, properties that, that could be very conducive to search and rescue missions and, and things of that nature in the, in the future. And then the, the final kind of example of what's going on with soft materials is the application of, of elastomeric materials for, for harvesting energy. Um, and, um, and, and so in, in this case, what you see are these, these, these rings or these cylindrical like objects that are uh, essentially a membrane of elastic material that uh, is then coated on both sides with a, a conductive compliant stretchable um, uh, electrode uh, type material, kind of a, a carbon paste. And um, essentially, each one of these units that you see in the, in the lower left is, is, is a, a variable capacitor. All right, and it, and it has some um, spring constant or some springiness associated with it. And then you put this on a buoy, and as the waves go by, you can, um, you can take the mechanical energy of the, of the waves and, and um, displace or, or compress or stretch these, these, um, these, uh, these, these units, these flexible units uh, that are variable capacitors and be able to convert the mechanical energy of the waves to, to electrical energy. All right? So these are some of the, the kind of the applications that are being enabled uh, with, with soft materials. Today I'm going to talk to you about uh, my research in terms of how um, the techniques I'm working on will uh, have enabled um, developments in, in, in fabricating these types of devices. And, um, and I hope you get an idea of, of you know, the, the potential applications that, that can stem for these fabrication processes in, in the future. So first I'll talk about centrifugal casting. Um, and our objective was to look at how we could produce microfluidic devices. Then I'll talk a little bit about paper-based electronic systems. Um, and I kind of showed you an image of one already. And, uh, and then we'll spend just a little bit of time at the end showing some kind of preliminary results and, and some work that we've also done um, with, with gripping uh, that, that is in the area of soft robots. Okay. So to, to start off, this, this thermosetting resin uh, PDMS is, is, a, is a great material for prototyping. Um, very good for micro nano replication. Uh, the white sides group in the past showed that uh, essentially you could get um, vertical replication on the order of a couple of nanometers um, and, and lateral replication on the order of uh, 30 nanometers or so. Um, and as I kind of mentioned before, it's very useful for uh, microfluidic valves and, and plumbing. But this material is essentially avoided for medium and, uh, to large scale production. And, and you ask yourself, why is that? Well, uh, we, we argue that there actually is an, a lack of efficient manufacturing um, know-how or, or a lack of uh, manufacturing processes for being able to do this type of micro-nano uh, replication with, with these thermosetting um, um, elastomers. And, th and this is what the typical PDMS processing procedure looks like. Uh, you have some type of mold with your, your features that you're interested in replicating. Uh, you fill the mold, and then you, uh, you degas in, in some type of chamber. And this, this jar you see on the right is, is pretty typical. And, um, and then you cure the, the polymer on this, on this mold, and after it's cured, you, you remove it. And, and so you know, this, is, this is a wonderful process for uh, the lab. You can very quickly turn around a, a, a new design and, and test it. But if you look at it from a, a fabrication, a, a manufacturing perspective, um, there, there's room for improvement. And so what we, what we looked at is, you know, what, what are the steps in this process and, and what are the rate limiting steps? And, and what we concluded is really degassing and, and, and curing are, are the kind of time consuming steps. And, uh, and so this is, this is kind of a, a larger, well, it's not really a microfluidic device, but this is the, just to give you an idea of, of the issues that, that you have if you don't degas or remove the bubbles properly from, from a particular mold. Right? So here's some, these are my fingers to, to give you an idea of, of the scale of these, of these, uh, these channels. 
And um, this is a, a part with, uh, with, a, with what I'll call controlled thickness. So it is, uh, you have a mold cavity, and we've introduced the PDMS, and, and we've, we've cured it, and these bubbles now are stuck in the part. And, um, and so, uh, you know, when you're a graduate student, you have the opportunity to, to, to meet lots of people. And, um, and A.J. Shrouth was a graduate student in another lab, and he saw me struggling with this, and he said, you know, have you thought about spinning? Have you thought about spinning to get rid of these bubbles? And I went home, and I got very excited about this idea, because um, this, this is something that, that, uh, that, that, that people have kind of known, that centrifugal casting is, um, is, is a technique for being able to, to mold uh, resins. But, but no one had thought about using it for the replication of, of micro nano features. And, um, and, uh, and, and so the process goes like this. Essentially, you have a mold cavity. right? Now we can control the thickness of, of the parts. We dispense PDMS into this mold. And, and then we spin. We spin for a long enough period of time so that we can remove the bubbles. And we'll talk about um, and what that means. We stop spinning. We cure. Um, the, uh, the part right now in a different station, but it could be done at the same time as you're spinning, if you run it, and then you remove the part. Um, and this, uh, I'll show a little bit of this video to give you an idea of, of what the process really looks like. Um, and so this is um, uh, a, a two-part solution. This is PDMS, uh, Silgard 184, if anyone's interested, the most commonly uh, used material, going through static mixers and into um, uh, different mold cavities. And this is a modified centrifuge, and we have this protective uh, covering that we put on top of it. And um, now we're spinning, as you can imagine. And, uh, and I just want to point out a, a couple of things here. So uh, this, is, this is now a transparent top um, on, on, the, on the mold that we're spinning. And, and PDMS was introduced uh, into this, this, this small hole near, near the center here of this image, but at the center of the centrifuge. And what you see here are, uh, uh, is, is the fluid you know, moving toward the, uh, the outskirts of the mold. And um, we go a little bit longer. And just after a few seconds, five seconds in this case, uh, you, you see that many of the bubbles that were originally present have now um, gone away. And uh, if you, now this is kind of a zoomed in view, right? So the center of the centrifuge is, is now somewhere in the kind of in the upper left. And what we're looking at now is one image taken per revolution of the, of the centrifuge um, so that you can, you can track this lateral motion of the bubbles as they're moving toward the center axis of rotation. Um, so then uh, we take out our, our molds. Um, and we put it, I, I built this, this heating and cooling station um, to facilitate faster um, curing of, of the PDMS than is, than is typically employed in the lab. Um, and so after about eight minutes, uh, you're, you're, able to, um, you're able to cure apart. Uh, this, is, this is what a part looks like. So okay. like right, the whole centrifugal the whole spinning process is, is, is occurring at room temperature, and we go about we go up to about 100 degrees Celsius in the heating and curing cell, in the cure, heating and curing station to just cure things, cure the PDMS. Yes. Would you expect the bubbles to go to leave faster if you heated it? So uh, this is an interesting point. When you heat a silicone, all right, the viscosity goes down, and we'll get into this a little bit, but that can enable faster displacement of of the bubbles. Now that's to a point, if you heat too quickly and you essentially freeze or you cure your polymer and you introduce elasticity, right, you'll freeze the bubbles potentially before they have an opportunity to escape. But if you heat it, you've got to lower the solubility of the gas in the Yes, that, that would be, in, that would be in, that's another potential, um, uh, uh, that I guess that would be another potential trade-off. So, so have you looked at that at all? We, uh, we have not, we, the, we have not, tried to do a detailed ex set of experiments to vary temperature uh, during, during the centrifugal casting process, no. Okay. Um, from a manufacturing perspective, we also wanted to show people that uh, you were able to produce parts uh, with, with low, low variation. Okay. So this is something that people don't typically do when they're prototyping PDMS devices, but since we're looking at manufacturing, what we did is we, we took uh, 20 different parts 
and we measure the heights and widths of, of a particular location on, on a microfluidic device and just show that the, the, the coefficient of variation is, is a less than a couple of percent. So now, the real question, though, from kind of, you know, uh, an academic perspective is, is how do we predict, you know, whether or not we're going to have bubbles or not in our parts? So, so here you, you see a couple of examples uh, of parts that we produce in this, in this process. And, you know, some, there are, there are bubbles, obviously, in this part on the right, and, and there are no bubbles on the left. And so, you know, how, how, do, we, how do we go about modeling this? Well, uh, one thing, you know, we have, and we, we just kind of talked about this, is we have the ability to track these bubbles so that uh, we can look at how our model predicts how, they're, how their travel, right? So we, this is kind of the setup. We have high-speed video camera looking down at, um, at, uh, at, uh, at our, our centrifugal setup. Um, and as we, we just talked about, right, in just a few seconds, when we're, so we're, in this case, we're spinning up to 5,000 revolutions per minute. Um, and uh, and in, in just a, a few seconds, you see that there are, we've, we've greatly reduced the number of bubbles inside the mold. And uh, this is, these are just some snapshots to give you an idea of how this process evolves. Um, and you kind of kind of see that. If you, if you want, you can argue this is a really large bubble. All right? And these really large bubbles, um, they are uh, they're moved out of solution very quickly. Question: Yeah. There is something transparent on top. Okay, and, and just uh, and just in a few seconds, and we can we can look at this again if we like to get an idea. And, and what you can pay attention to here is that the the large bubbles really they travel as as, as we'll talk about, and as you'd expect much more quickly than, than the smaller bubbles, all right, towards the center axis. Yes? Do you use photographic uh, yeah, photography here to track the individual bubbles, uh, or you uh, spin the camera together? So what we do is we have a tachometer um, that is looking at a little reflective point on the spinning rotor, and it gives you a high signal every time it detects um, that, that, that reflective point, and then that sends a signal to our high-speed camera, and it takes an image. Okay, we've done both. We've, uh, yeah, you could use a, um, a, 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 a stroboscope to, to, to kind of um, to, to look at this process as well. Mm-hmm. The thickness essentially remains the same. Are you changing the pressure in that system at all? Of course. That. Yes, of course. And we're, we're, we're going there. We're going there. I wanted to ask you questions. Yes. You mentioned an acceleration. Is that the acceleration the bubble experiences, or is that the revolutions per minute? Yes. So I'm talking about the, the, the acceleration of the centrifuge as it's going up. But the bubbles can change their speed as they're moving toward the center axis rotation. And we'll get to that. All right, good, good. Um, so uh, the, 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 the first uh, mechanism for removing bubbles is, is buoyancy, as we've been talking about, right? So if you think about this, you have um, uh, a, a mass of the bubbles, which we consider very negligible, considered to the amount of um, acceleration we're introducing on the displaced volume of fluid. All right, so, but there's, there's technically an MA term, um, and we have buoyant force on, on these bubbles, right? and we have drag force, and we calculate then what their velocity should be okay, at, at any given location. And it goes with the, uh, as you expect, right, acceleration in a spinning, in a centrifugal field, essentially uh, the acceleration outward goes with omega squared r. And larger bubbles, so this is velocity, larger bubbles will move more quickly, right? You have uh, the buoyant force going with the volume of, 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 of a bubble, and the drag force is just going with uh, the, the diameter of the bubble. What causes the drag force? The drag, so essentially you can think of it as a Stokes flow about a sphere, okay? And, it's, and, it's, and we're, we have a laminar regime. We use this Hadamard Rzymski. <laughs> Um, a treatment because I in reality you can have slip on the surface. So the Stokes flow approximation assumes that you have a no slip condition 
on the out, outside, of this, uh, outside of a spherical particle. But with bubbles, and assuming that you don't have contamination okay, of the surface, um, uh, the, the essentially the drag coefficient can be, is, is reduced. So for non-fluid people like me, the Stokes model, I mean, what is on the surface? What, what's causing the, the drag? So it's essentially, you can think of it as a cross-sectional area. I mean, kind of backing out, right? Like, anytime an object is dropping, right, it reaches a terminal velocity after some period of time, right? And it has some type of cross-sectional area that uh, is, is resisting, you know, the, the, the flow of air or fluid around it. And that's the drag force, essentially, keeping the, the bubble from, um, you know, from, from, from progressing in this direction. It depends on viscosity, and it depends on its diameter, and the relative velocity of the fluid to the object. Okay? Um, the other thing we keep track of is the pressure of the fluid. Okay? So the pressure, so the, the acceleration goes with omega squared r, um, and the pressure of the fluid goes with omega squared, and the, the difference in the squares of where that liquid air interfaces, so you, know, you notice here, when we start the liquid air interface, it's it's horizontal because gravity, right, is is dictating that uh, the, the 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 interface be be horizontal. But now the the you know we have essentially thousands or tens of thousands of G's acting radially outward, which shifts this surface to be to be vertical. So essentially, if you want to know the pressure at any given point in the solution, it's it's related to the the spin speed squared and the, the difference of the squares um, of, of, uh, of its position relative to, to where this liquid air interface is. And then on top of that, though, we had to keep track of what the pressure is inside the bubble itself. So with the Laplace-Young relationship, all right, we, we know that uh, essentially the, the pressure inside a bubble scales with the, or the pressure difference between the, the, the pressure inside the bubble and the pressure in the surrounding solution, it scales with the inverse of the, uh, the, the radius and also scales proportionally to, to surface tension. All right, so uh, to give you an idea, this is, so what we do, right, here's a bubble, here's a bubble. This is, we've select, you know, various bubbles and look at them as they're moving toward the center axis of rotation. We use our model and we, we say, okay, are we able to, you know, with the assumptions that we're making, are we able to, to, to accurately describe its trajectory? For the center, and uh, and so these are some results. So uh, this is uh, this is time on the x-axis, and we're looking at the diameter now. Uh, with the resolution, uh, and, and maybe if we use a, a stroboscope, we could improve the, the resolution. But um, what you see in the in the blue are the the measured diameters of this bubble as it's moving toward the center axis of rotation. Right, it's a little bit noisy, and this green line represents our prediction. And then down here, we uh, we use we're using our model, and we're fitting, and we're looking at. The, the comparison of its distance from the center as, as time progresses. So that, that's, the, that's buoyancy, right? And actually, that model that I showed actually takes into account the, the things we're going to talk about uh, right now, which is, which is diffusion, all right? So uh, in 1915, Epstein Plessett described uh, bubble growth uh, or bubble dissolution um, based on a, a gradient in concentration. So if you have a lot of air dissolved in the wall of a bubble, okay, relative to the amount of air dissolved in the surrounding solution, you have a concentration gradient, which means that air will go from the inside of the bubble to the surrounding solution. Likewise, if it's the opposite, if the concentration of air dissolved in um, the surrounding solution is greater than that of the air dissolved in the wall of the bubble, um, the air will come into the bubble and the bubble will grow. All right? And so this delta, this is, this is the relationship they described for the, the rate of change of the radius of the bubble as a function of time. And this delta is just this difference in the, in the gradient, or the difference in the concentration of dissolved air in the wall of the bubble and in the surrounding solution. So we're concerned about uh, about mostly about optical clarity and, and restriction of channels. For example, in steels, you can have something called hydrogen cracking. So when dissolved hydrogen gets into the, uh, the, the material, it can cause 
uh, essentially brittleness or, or, or mechanical failure under stress. We weren't so concerned about affecting the mechanical properties, but my intuition says that, yeah, you could do a detailed study to look at the effects of dissolved air in PDMS and, and come up with um, some, you know, some relationship between dissolved air content and, and, and mechanical strength. But it's not something you're finding, you're just trying to get the bubble That's out. right, and that's right. That's right. It, we don't care if the bubbles end up dissolved in a solution or if uh, you know they uh, they're evacuated with, with the buoyant trans, with the buoyant uh, travel. Okay. So I have seen bubbles coalesce, and we can talk that. Will, that's an interesting point. Um, we can maybe we'll come back to that in just a second because it could affect things. The fact of the matter, you know, is that in the end we make the right simplifications to be able to accurately make predictions you know, that match our experimental uh, results. But multi-phase flow, yes, it's, a, it's, a, an, it's, it's something, it's an opportunity to kind of enhance the modeling that we've looked at. Yeah. OK, so now, um, uh, this, this is also from Epstein and Plessen in the same paper. And in this case, the equation gets a little more complicated. Um, but but they, what they included now are the effects of surface tension, which we were, which we were kind of alluding to before. And what we do is we define this, this extra parameter, which is essentially um, uh, what, we, what we might call a supersaturation uh, fraction. So it describes the relative uh, concentrations of, of dissolved air in the surrounding solution and in the wall of the bubble when the wall of the bubble is of infinite, or if the bubble is of infinite size. Okay? And there is a condition for growth. Uh, if the radius is above some critical, this critical diameter dictated by um, uh, essentially the CF parameter having to be greater than one, so the concentration of, of dissolved air in the surrounding solution is greater than one, um, and, and, uh, and the pressure of the fluid, uh, you, can get, uh, you can get bubbles to grow. Okay? And, and so this is something that doesn't happen when we're spinning, but we wanted to understand this relationship a little bit better. So we did experiments to look at bubble growth. Right? What, what we have here, these, these images look similar to what I've shown you before, but we introduced solution into the mold, and we spun just briefly to fill the mold, and then let things sit. So we had bubbles, essentially, still trapped in solution. And the solution was super, slightly supersaturated uh, because uh, of the mold filling process or because of environmental conditions, which dictated that bubbles, in fact, grow. But they grow, they grow slowly. Um, you, so you see, you can see these, these small bubbles, and then after 30 minutes, they grow a little bit larger. After 80 minutes, they grow, and then six hours later, they're, they're of this size. And so we, uh, we, we looked at a few of these bubbles, and we tracked um, and, and measured their, their, their growth and fitted a curve to it. Now, uh, these, this curve right here represents what our, our fit, okay? This, this, this red line. And then this blue line represents the, the predictions from the Epstein-Plessen model. You say, oh man, that's not a very good fit. That doesn't look good at all. Well, what happens, right, is that over time, this, this material, um, the, the way we've done it, 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 it begins to cure. All right, and it, it builds up some elasticity, as, as we were talking about. Now, the objective of my research was not to uh, look at you know, uh, the curing kinetics. Actually, someone after me uh, did his PhD thesis. Yeah, Ehern um, Long, if you're interested, you can, you can look up his, his, uh, his, his thesis. And he looked at the curing kinetics, not necessarily of bubbles, but curing kinetics in general of PDMS. Uh, but, but what we see here is that, at least for the first few hours, we were able to fit appropriately before the, before the curing and the elasticity sets in, right? So let's go. Yeah. You spun this thing up. Yes. The system experienced pressure. Yes. You stopped it. Yes. And you watched the bubbles. That's right. It seems to me there are two processes that could go on. Number one, that bubbles could re-precipitate because the pressures come down. Uh-huh. And number two, the bubbles could coarse. Uh-huh. What, what's dominant here? So the, uh, that, that's a good question. So like, you're, maybe, maybe I can make sure I understand. So what you're saying is that with, if you had a bubble, uh, some of the bubbles could go into solution. Some of the bubbles could go into solution. Some of the bubbles will not necessarily go into solution. Some will, right? And we're just interested in looking at their growth, at some of the growth of the bubbles. 
Uh, it depends on what their, so this is an interesting question. It depends on what their initial size would have been, all right? Um, it is possible that some could have gotten to be very, 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 very small, and then they, they start to evolve again. I, I, I agree. And so what we did is we said, okay, at the limit of our detection, we selected a few of these bubbles that were essentially in some type of transient state. They were already growing, all right? And what we wanted to do is we wanted to map out their continual growth. So maybe these, these, some of these bubbles you know, were, were very, very, very small at some period of time, but we can only see them at after, you know, some, a little bit later in, in time, essentially. So growth, then, is that the big ones get bigger, the small ones get smaller? Is this Oswald ripening type thing? Uh, <laughs> so Oswald ripening. So we, for, the, for the, the, the sizes that would have been getting smaller, which is what you're, what you're talking about, so essentially, if, you're absolutely right. We didn't, we, didn't, we didn't detect those. We couldn't see those at the scale we were looking at. And so I agree 100% that there could have been very small bubbles that went right into the solution. And they did so very quickly. All right? But we're looking at the, and they would have still been exposed to the same um, uh, supersaturation fraction that the larger bubbles that are growing were, were experiencing. Right? But again, we're interested in just trying to figure out what that supersaturation fraction was based on the bubbles that we could see grow. Okay. Um, so, the so one thing uh, here is that I showed you bubbles that were essentially unrestrained, but bubbles in reality can get stuck in particular locations within a mold. All right, and um, in some cases we might design an intentional bubble trap. In other cases, they might get stuck around a mold insert. And um, and so what happens to these bubbles? Well, essentially. You, you turn off the, the ability of these bubbles to move toward the in, in, you know, to the center axis of rotation, and you essentially have to say, okay, diffusion is the only way for these things to go. So these are some simulated results just to give you an idea of how this effect could um, uh, limit or increase the amount of time required to spin an ND gas solution. So let's say a bubble starts out at, uh, with a diameter of, of, of a couple millimeters. This sharp decrease that you see here is just because of the pressurization of the mold. Okay, so in this case, um, the mold is accelerating, or the spinning is accelerating up to um, uh, 7,000 revolutions per minute uh, with an acceleration of about 300 revolutions per minute per second. Okay, so within a few seconds, we've gotten up to um, our, our, our speed. Um, and then uh, what you see here is once we've gotten to that steady state speed, the bubble, it begins to dissolve in solution. But it initially, so it went from two millimeters, and just with pressurization, it went down to uh, a millimeter in diameter. And then hundreds of seconds later, that bubble has dissolved into solution. All right? This is an argument for using uh, uh, centrifugal casting and not just pressure, okay? at least for these, for these types of pressures, which are on the order of uh, you know, tens of, of, of PSI. So injection molding would use higher pressures, arguably. But, but um, it's, 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 it's good, it's, it's something to keep in mind is that you don't necessarily want large bubbles just getting trapped in a particular location. You want them to be able to, to move out of solution. Okay. Sure. Yes? Can I go back to that simulation and just ask, what are the assumptions behind that simulation? This, this simulation is assuming that they're spherical, okay, which is not 100% certain. We're using the epstein plesset model and that we know the pressure, the surface, ten and surface tension, and the initial supersaturation fraction of air dissolved into the solution. So that discussion about diffusion is not taking Oh, this is diffusion. This is, this is only diffusion. This is only diffusion. It's saying, I have a spherical bubble. You know, if I'm spinning about this axis, I have a spherical bubble at this distance, OK? And it is, I'm not allowing buoyancy to move it forward, but it has to stay right there. And the only way for it to go away, to be removed, is for diffusion to take the gas inside the bubble and, 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 and get it into the surrounding solution. So I guess I have to ask, do you know whether these have any validity, this simulation? So there is, what I'll say is, we haven't necessarily done a detailed <laughs> set of experiments to kind of get exactly these results. But what we've noticed in, in practice is that sometimes you do need to spin a little bit longer. And what I'll show you right now is it, it appears to be because 
bubbles get trapped in a given location, or they get trapped in a crevice. So what I'll show you here is, um, um, this is a, this, so these are cured parts, all right? And what you see is you see the stream of bubbles, and it's emanating from this edge at this point. And so what this suggests that you, so what you can do is you can, obviously you can spin a little bit longer to avoid this type of problem. But in the cases where, where you don't, you can have bubbles that get trapped in a trench. They don't dissolve completely into solution. As the centrifuge slows down, okay, the, the pressure is, uh, goes from being high, can go to low. These bubbles have the opportunity to expand. They can then potentially, when they, after they've expanded, they can potentially come up. And if the centrifuge is still spinning and they're large enough, they can actually be moved toward the center axis of rotation and end up over your regions of interest and essentially be a defect. Okay? So it's something you, you, need, you should keep in mind as well. All right, so let me just talk about that. So we, we've talked a little bit about what happens in your simulations if you, you, know, you fix the bubbles at, given, at a given location. But what we do is we combine these two mechanisms of buoyancy and, and, uh, and diffusion. Right? And it's, 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 it's pretty straightforward. What we do is we, we keep track of these bubbles, uh, their mass, and their location. All right? So here's their mass, here's the location. We know the rate of change based on the epstein plesset relationship, the rate of change in the mass, that is. And then our simulations, they terminate, terminate when the bubble reaches the liquid air interface near the center axis of rotation, or uh, the bubbles dissolve into solution. All right. And uh, so here are some simulated results of, of this combined model. The bubbles, they start on, this, this right high, on the right-hand side, and they move to, to the left, right? So they start away from the center axis of rotation. They move closer to the, the center axis of rotation. Very large bubbles, they can start out here. Well, they're not that large, but they're 250 microns in diameter. And these bubbles, they have the opportunity for these particular conditions to make it all the way to the liquid air interface near the center axis of rotation. Okay, they're large enough. Now you see their diameter can change a little bit. And actually, it can, if you look at the slope of this, right? In this case, because of the pressurization, the, the bubbles are, are um, uh, they, they, they shrink a little bit, but then they can actually increase in, in their diameter as the pressure gets less and less close to the center axis of rotation. Smaller bubbles, they don't necessarily have that opportunity to make that whole journey toward the liquid air interface, but they will dissolve into solution, and so they end here. And then there are bubbles of a critical size. Okay, these are kind of the pesky bubbles, the rate limiting bubbles, that they make that whole journey, but it takes them a lot longer to do so. Another way to look at it is, is this way. So now let's talk about time. Right? So here are a set of, of bubbles of different initial diameters, and um, here is the time required to remove them. And what you see is over here is, for the large bubbles, buoyancy dominates. So these bubbles, you know, that two millimeter bubble that we said was a problem, as long as it's not constrained within the mold and it moves, uh, we can get it out of solution. Um, and then the bubbles that are very, very small because of pressurization, they will dissolve right into solution. So there are bubbles of a critical size that are the ones that take the longest to get out of solution. So now we've talked about the model. Let's, let's do a DOE, design, a design set of experiments, to compare this model with, um, the, uh, with, 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 with bubbles that we counted in solution. And um, what you see here right, uh, is a plot of the, the time that we s essentially spun the centrifuge versus a spin speed. So as you would expect, and then each one of these asterisks represents the average of four different parts. Right? So as you would expect, if you spin at a high speed, say 4,000 revolutions per minute, for a very long period of time, you count the number of bubbles left in the part, and uh, we, we found a zero. If you spin at a slow speed uh, for a short period of time, you have lots of bubbles left in solution. So we had about 70 bubbles in this case. And then uh, you'll, you'll see that there's kind of this division between the parts that have bubbles and, and the parts that, that do not. And, if, and these lines represent our simulated results. And what we found is when we look at removing 99% of the bubbles, this green line nicely delineates the parts that have bubbles from those that, that do not. And this is the verification of our, our simulated results. So to kind of conclude this portion of centrifugal casting, I'd just like to show you some of the things that this, this technology does, in fact, enable. Um, here are mated pairs of molds. Um, and, and so this is an insert here. This is another insert here. 
And we're spinning in, in the centrifuge about this axis of rotation. Um, and, and this is the design part. Um, what we have here, uh, remember at the very beginning I was talking about how you would pressurize one set of valves to block flow in another. Well, that's what we're trying to do in, in, in this example. Right? So we have these control channels that we, we can pressurize to then block flow in the, what we call the flow channels. Uh, and, and, and this is just a depiction of that. So these would be channels on one side of the part. This is not to scale, but when you pressurize them, they, they uh, collapse the channels in, in the opposite side of the part. And typically what is done is the, is the fabrication of multiple parts, or essentially two pieces of flexible PDMS that you then have to very carefully align and bond to each other. Uh, and so here, here are results. This is a, a chamber. The fluid in the flow channels is coming in um, from, from the sides. And the, the, in the upper left, what you see is, un, is, uh, is fluid flowing in with, from, with unblocked channels. And you have this nice interface near the middle. We then block this, this side. And you can kind of see that it's slightly blocked here. And this fluid uh, interface, it moves from the, the center to, to the left, right? And because this side is dominating. We let things return to equilibrium, and uh, then we block on this side, and it, the, the, the interface moves to, moves to the right. So this is validation that, in fact, we are able to mold features in opposite sides of a part and, and be able to control flow. So some advantages of centrifugal casting. We're able to mold micro nano features. Uh, we're controlling the thickness of the parts, which is not typically done, but is very important from a manufacturing perspective. Uh, these machines are not necessarily very large. They can fit on your bench. Um, it, they're good for small quantities of, of, of material, so you don't necessarily have to fill um, uh, the, the, the kind of the, the, the screw the screw area of, a, of an injection molding machine um, in order to be able to produce one part. We move the bubbles quickly on the order of a minute, and um, there's opportunity to look at kind of the energy efficiency of this process, but just kind of as an upper limit for the amount of energy that we're consuming, a few outlets it comes out to be about 6,000 watts. So uh, now I'll talk some about paper-based electronics, and then uh, we'll go briefly through soft robots. So um, in, in paper -based, for paper-based electronics, our argument is that current buttons are not thin enough, not low cost enough, um, and not easy enough to array um, for disposable applications. And so you ask yourself the question, what would you do if you had these types of buttons? And there are potential applications in flexible or wearable electronics and smart packaging, um, user interfaces for sterile or contaminated environments, and also um, potentially as, as human interfaces that could save energy that might be expended in backlit displays, so kiosks or, or, um, uh, or election machines, kind of you know, futuristic type ideas and applications. What does the material look like? It looks like uh, paper with a, with a few... Uh, coatings on top. Uh, what you have here are cellulose fibers, and then there's, there are a couple layers of polymer, uh, followed by a very thin, you can just barely see it, 10 nanometer thick layer of evaporated aluminum. And then on top of that, you have, you have uh, additional polymer to protect the surface. And this is a commercially available product, um, available from a company in Western Massachusetts. Um, the company is called Vacuumet. What we did is we did some characterization, so we, we cut strips of different size and looked at the their resistance across them. And then we estimated their thickness and compared that to what we were told is the amount of evaporated aluminum. And um, we, we ended up it being in very nice agreement. The, uh, the, essentially, the thickness is on the order of, it, it's, it's less than 20 nanometers. It's on the order of 10 nanometers. Right? So we've, we've looked at different designs uh, for being able to detect touch. Okay? And this is based on measuring changes in capacitance. So in this case, we have multiple layers of, of paper, and there's a gap. And we apply pressure, and we're able to detect change in capacitance. Um, and uh, the, essentially, these are, these are capacitors in, in, in parallel, which, which, which add. Uh, what we did for detection initially it was excite our system with a sinusoidally varying voltage. So we have these RC circuits. And we looked at the potential across the capacitor and as the, the, essentially as the capacitance went up with, with deflection, uh, that changed the RC time constant and, and, um, and uh, it resulted in an attenuation of, of voltage across the capacitor. 
The next design um, did not involve any mechanical displacement, but just involved coupling to the, a, a top layer capacitor. And, uh, and so this is implementation of, of, of that. In this case, the, the capacitance, you, you are essentially a capacitor, and the, the people that do electrostatic discharge would estimate that you're about 100 picofarads of capacitance in series with uh, 1.5 kilo ohms of resistance. And then the final design, which we really um, were very excited about, is only requires one layer of, of metallized paper. And what we do is we etch traces in the single layer, and we allow the finger then to bridge the gap between these, these, these separate electrodes. And in this case, you have not only the capacitance of you going to ground, but you have the capacitance through the tip of a finger. Um, and we also changed our, our method of detection. What we did is we excite with step waves, and we look at the rise time associated uh, with the voltage uh, across the capacitor in our RC circuit. And in the case on the left, it's about 13 microseconds, and then in the case on the right, it goes to about 1,300 microseconds. And another way to look at this is we go from tens of picofarads of capacitance to over 1,000 picofarads of capacitance with, with a touch. And these are, uh, this is, these are experiments showing that, uh, that uh, in fact, with a bare finger, the change is much larger than that with a gloved finger. This red line is at the same value, same threshold value. And these buttons will do over 1,000 touches. We, are those red crosses? These red crosses are when our controller detected a touch. OK, so when we cross the threshold, bing, you've touched it. Whoa, whoa, what? Oh, so that's endure, right, right. Over, I mean, in reality, they endure like over a couple thousand. I, I sat there with a metronome. That's right. Okay, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, they'll, they'll last at least a... That, that's just when I ran out of tapping energy. Yeah, they, they, they were still going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I did it myself. Maybe, maybe I could have gotten someone else to help me out, but it was good enough, right? We're talking one-time use. We're talking one-time use applications. It worked a thousand times. That's good enough for one-time use. All right, so what I want to show you here is how the capacitance doesn't change as we vary temperature. So we put this into a, 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 a room, or not a room, into a, just a chamber. And we vary the temperature from modest change, but 25 to 57 degrees Celsius. And then we also looked at the effects of humidity. And, um, uh, and so what you see here is this profile humidity over a period of minutes. And humidity does, in fact, have a, a profound effect on, on the capacitance once we got to this value of about 85%. So essentially, um, what, what was happening um, is, uh, is moisture was accumulating. What, what, I, what I believe to be happening is moisture was accumulating on the paper. And it actually provides, kind of a, it provides a, um, a conductive path, essentially. And so this is that, these are the same data, but they're plotted. Um, as effective capacitance versus the relative humidity. And this is the humidity going up. And then you see his, this hysteretic behavior, which I believe is associated with, with the net amount of time required for that moisture to dry and the devices to return to their original level of performance. And we also used an LCR meter, and we looked at the um, capacitance of, of a button uh, without moisture. This is a different set of experiments, but without moisture, we had an effective resistance of, of hundreds of megohms. But then with moisture, that decreased by essentially six orders of magnitude, right? So kind of validating the idea that, in fact, the moisture does couple in. And it's not just effective, it's not just capacitance. We measure it as effective capacitance, but in fact, there's uh, a component of, of conductivity to it. Uh, we've also tested these buttons in the cold, four degrees Celsius, relative humidity of 50%. They work. And uh, here's some um, applications. So here's a 10 button keypad. Here's a, 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 a keypad that we folded around the cube. Um, this is just to show that they are, in fact, flexible. So what we've done is that, that this is that same uh, two-dimensional cutout that we had around the cube, but now we've put it around a vial. You can see this thing flexing, and it's not triggering these, these LEDs because the, essentially the values of the, the thresholds that we've set have to be so high that just flexing does not change the capacitance un enough to, to, to get to detect them. Uh, the capacitance does not change enough to get a false positive result. Um, and then we've arrayed. Uh, this is Will Kalb is the undergraduate who worked with me. Um, 
And we have a paper that should come out soon, I think, in advanced materials. Um, and uh, and uh, so this is Will's hand. Um, and the final demonstration I'll show you is us putting this on the side of a box. Um, essentially, it, it works as a security keypad. Um, if you do not enter the right password, you're not able to disarm the box and open it without setting off an alarm. Um, there, it, it, was, it does have an audio component. I didn't do a good job of getting that recorded, but what you see here is when the alarm goes off, both of these LEDs also on the metalized paper light up. And then it is dis disarmed. This is also a capacitive switch, so that's the same material. And when the, the lids are far apart, the capacitance goes down, and we, we recognize that the box has been opened. So to, to kind of conclude, to summarize this section, um, paper-based touchpads, they're low cost. The material costs less than a dollar per square meter. And uh, they're, they're good for capacitive sensing. Um, just real briefly, let me show you uh, a few of the things that we've been working on um, with soft robots. This is, these are preliminary results. And what we have here is a, 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 a material or composite material that's just a few, hundreds mic few hundred microns in thickness. And uh, we've, we've essentially put bellows along this. And we're still trying to figure out the physics and, and what's really going on here. But um, we, this, this material, which is just a few hundred microns in thickness, is able to get displacements on the order of centimeters. Not much force, but large displacement. And so we're, we're, well, I'm excited about the potential applications. We've, we've done some work with, with gripping in the past, so I just want to show you um, this, this type of work here where we've now got these, these, these linear or actuators and we can pick up lightweight, lightweight materials. What we're trying to get away from are the, com the complexity and the, uh, the hard articulated joints uh, that you, you find with traditional um, robots. These are basically pneumatic. These are pneumatically driven, yes. Okay. So um, again, you know, cost is, is something that we're striving to, to reduce. And uh, this, these, these soft actuators are capable of handling fragile objects. And there's also this idea of simplicity. So uh, being able to kind of stack uh, simple elements in some type of repeatable fashion, if it's in a linear array or if it's in, in the Z direction, to be able to en enable uh, functionality. So to conclude, um, you know, we've talked a little bit about designing manufacture of soft material-based systems. And there are a variety of high-tech applications that, that, that stem from the type of work that I've been able to be involved with. Um, and really, you know, we're, we're trying to keep costs low. This is, this is one of the, the, the objectives of advanced manufacturing. Um, and underlying all of this, there's this idea of simplicity. Um, and that can connect to, to low cost. And, and, and George is really a proponent for, um, for, for trying to, to, to think about how we design simple systems that are, are good uh, for, for real world applications. Um, there have been, been a lot of people that have been involved um, with, with the development of these projects. Let me just point out a, a few. So um, uh, over here, Dave Hart uh, advised me during the centrifugal casting. It was a very fun environment to be in. Uh, essentially, we looked at we were, the rules were just let's do microfluidics and manufacturing, and let's come up with with you know concrete methods for being able to make advances in the field. Um, George, obviously, Will is is this undergraduate that worked with me, and he's been great. Philip Ivlieski, um he's one of the the pioneering uh, forces in in the area of soft robots. It's been a pleasure to work with him. Rob Shepard, he um, uh, really led the effort in the locomotive soft robot that I showed you at the beginning. And then there are a, a variety of other people that have been helpful, and I'd like to thank these people for funding and um, take any uh, questions that you might have. So I'd like to uh, congratulate you on stimulating questions and receiving them well and with a smile. Um, <laughs> this is before your question, right? This is, this <laughs> I just want to come back to these uh, wave energy guys. So I'd be curious, what thermodynamic efficiency do these things have? And what do you see as the biggest barrier to that direction moving forward? Right. So uh, right now, people in, in the field are touting the 
energy per mass ratio that dielectric elastomers promise. And the upper estimate, which appears to maybe be a little bit high, is on the order of 0.4 joules per gram. But getting to that upper estimate actually usually at this point in time requires sacrificing some inefficiency. Okay, so if you have a wave, for example, right, that has all this energy, on the one hand you can say, look, I'm interested in, even though I'm really inefficient, I'm just interested in getting the most, uh, most amount for the amount of weight of the particular you know, device I'm fabricating. That's one way to look at it. If, you go to, if you're willing to go to smaller displacements, okay, and you don't necessarily run into the limits of, of, um, uh, of, of, of the material in terms of either cracking, uh, electrostatic rate, a variety of things, you, uh, and also um, uh, resilience potentially of, of the material, you can get to higher efficiencies, all right? But there is this trade-off. There is this trade-off. Where does cost come into that? Right, so cost right now, the, the argument and, and what I'm interested in pursuing, right, and, and, and um, is looking at ways to, uh, to, to reduce it with, uh, with, with kind of different methods of, of, of fabrication. In principle, uh, the number of components, at least on the mechanical end, is, is very few. You have a piece of rubber. It could be natural rubber, natural rubber which is uh, arguably a renewable source, okay? And then essentially a, a conductive paste that you smear around the outside or the and the interior of, of these cylindrical uh, sheets of sheets of rubber. So the the mechanical um, components, arguably with with more research, can be made very very um, inexpensively. There will be electronics that have to go on with that as well, and there are there's room for improvement in terms of of getting those down and. The, the two companies that are kind of, I think, at the, at the lead of this effort right now, they are, they are SRI International in terms of commercialization and also um, FBM, SBM Offshoring, a French company. And so they, they're actually, you know, they're, they're looking at, uh, at harvesting energy um, from, from waves. So what does um, salt water do to these polymers? Right, so, um, eh, you know, that, that's a good question. I, I, can, I, can, I don't know the exact you know, results, but what I can say is, yeah, you might want to encapsulate, right, in some type of additional um, material. Make sure that the salt water doesn't uh, get to your electrodes and your, your material. So harvesting energy from waves is sort of one extreme in terms of amount of energy you get. What about application in, in, in an operation, a very micro-scale harvesting where you might have devices that you don't really want to put batteries on? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. How does this scale down? Right. Um, and so you know the this this these materials are um, are soft. Okay. And so generally it means that for a given amount of force you get a large displacement. Okay. So one thing to consider. Okay. If you're looking at vibrating bridge or something is is kind of this idea of impedance matching. And so people have looked at electrostatic harvesting kind of in MEMS based devices. And these are very low, very low power type electronic applications. And um, you know, I think some people argue, yeah, there, there's, there's room for them and, and that's good. You know, I'm, that, that's fine. I think there's room for everyone. That, that's great. Um, but uh, uh, the, the advantage, I, I don't know if I see, you know, I see elastomers coming more into play where you have some type of, you know, mesoscale type displacement, all right? So whether or not you have to have some type of transmission system to scale up small vibrations, you know, so that you're oscillating some, I don't know, pendulum or something, so that you get these large displacements, so then you can convert, you know, with the, the last numeric material to, you know, useful energy, eh, okay, that's fine. That, that might be some clever mechanical design. But, um, but for, for small displacements, I don't, I don't know if elastomers are, are necessarily the solution. The advantage of elastomers, though, Right, is that you have the conservation of volume. So the capacitor in a MEMS device, that capacitance will only change as the displacement. I mean, I could be wrong. People could design flexures or some other cl clever thing. But right now, essentially, the capacitance only changes as you change the displacement, the distance between them, the plates. With the elastomer, when you change the distance, or you know, when you put strain on the elastomer, you can also change as the distance between the, the conductors 
decreases, you can also get a, an increase in the cross-sectional area of, of them. And so that's kind of one of the advantages of, of, of the last numeric approach. Yeah, sorry yes. to keep drawing on something that wasn't really in your talk. Yeah. But uh, I was thinking about it a little bit, and I, was, I, you know, I think it would be interesting to know more of kind of the reasons why, or you know, what are the advantages of, of an elastomeric dielectric? Mm -hmm. I mean, is it dielectric constant? Is that an aspect? Compared to um, air? Compared to sure. air? Or a sure. I mean, what, one of the thoughts I had was you're kind of using it as a spring to return to your initial steady state. That's right. Yeah. Right, right. And, and then you have hysteresis loss in the, in the material. Right. Um, so, you know, it would be interesting to know your, your, your take on why, why you use that right. as opposed to some other capacitive energy uh, scavenging device. Right. And I think the idea in the end is, is really to get cost down. The idea, it comes back to, you know, what we we're talking about here is uh, it's essentially a piece of rubber with, with conductors smeared on, on either side of it. And so it provides a spring, springiness, right? It provides high dielectric strength. Um, it provides higher dielectric constant, um, both dielectric strength and dielectric constant that are higher than, than air. So for example, these electrostatic, these small electrostatic um, devices that we're talking about. And I, I think uh, kind of, I, mean, I guess backing out, maybe I shouldn't say this, but you know, from a philosophical perspective, right? You know, we are essentially some type of 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 going away from. So let's say that waves are a nice match with respect to impedance to these soft materials, right? But also, if we're interested in harvesting energy from a person, all right, we 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 have you know soft tissue, we have muscle, um, and there also seems to kind of be a nice impedance match for the, the, um, uh, the elasticity of our muscle and, and the forces that we're able to exert compared to kind of the structures we're talking about with these elastomeric devices as well. Yes? I want to go back to the spin casting process. Yes. And the, the technology most like that that I'm familiar with is for, uh, for making transformers. Uh -huh. The traditional way is the so-called vacuum impregnation of varnish in the transformer. And there, as I understand it, there are two ways of doing that. One is you immerse it and then pump a vacuum right. to get the bubbles out. Yeah. The other way of doing it is you first pump the vacuum and then you drop it in. Yeah. And then you don't have any bubbles because it, it wasn't. You took the air out of the cavity before you even put it in there. Right. Right. Is that an option in something like this, or what? what would you uh, absolutely. Uh, that's something we, we've talked about. We talked about applying vacuum during spinning, um, you know, as kind of a, a future um, enhancement of, of the process as well. And we didn't. We actually kind of with Dave Hart, we were when we were thinking about this problem, we were like, you know, we want to get away from using vacuum. Actually, we don't necessarily want to introduce that additional complexity of of having a vacuum. But in a manufacturing setting. It's very typical for people to, to apply vacuum to polymer in reservoirs before it's applied. And I think our model can account for that. We didn't do those experiments, but our modeling and understanding could enhance um, the, you know, the, 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 the production of those types of devices as well. I'm not sure what, what modeling, if you're doing the vacuum first. So the, what affects... So the modeling essentially is you apply the vacuum first, and you, what you do is you change the amount of, because we talked about this, constant, this super saturation fraction. So essentially what you're doing is you're changing the amount of dissolved air in the solution before you, uh, you, you, um, you introduce the, uh, the material to your mold. All right, so essentially all we do is we change that, that initial concentration value, and then we go about and we can calculate out how long it will take to remove the bubbles. I'm afraid that we're going to leave it at that. So it's so yeah. stimulating, but uh, uh, time is of the essence. <laughs> the clock is going out. So thank you again for okay. the